What up gamers? I'm Jason. And I'm Julie. And today on Dice and Dragons we are going to be reviewing Tainted Grail, The Fall of Avalon. This is the first campaign, well, the first part of the whole Tainted Grail series, if that's what you want to call it. We got a lot more content coming from the Kickstarter. It is published by Awakened Realms, and the game is designed by Christoph Piskorski and Marcin Swierkot. Hope I pronounced the name right. You know, if you do happen to watch the video, feel free to let us know down in the comments below how I should pronounce them. And with that being said, Julie's now going to tell you more about the game itself. So it's a cooperative game that plays uh, four, one to four players. It's intended for ages 14 and above. And each story is apparently supposed to take two to three hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a complete lie. We went on quite the adventure with chapter two. How long do you think our second chapter took us, Julie? Uh, six to eight hours. I'd say it's definitely closer to the, yeah, between six to eight hours. We definitely got to see a lot of the map, so it's pretty cool. That exploration element is something we're going to talk more about when we get into our review of the game. Now, like our folklore video, this video is a little different. After this section, we are going to be covering the components. The how to play will be an entirely separate video. And yes, I know I still owe you a folklore video. We've just been quite busy. I would expect to see the videos for the how to play for Tainted Grail, as well as folklore completed either by the end of this month or early March is the goal of getting them out. Now, what are you going to be doing in Tainted Grail, The Fall of Avalon? Well, you're going to be traveling across the land, questing, and now this is uh, quite the open world adventure, if you would agree. Mm -hmm. And as you quest, you're going to be needing to light the different maneers. I believe that's how they're pronounced. I think so too. <laughs> and in doing that, you're going to be able to reveal more locations, but be careful as the maneers, once they're lit, they will not necessarily stay lit. So this is also a resource management game. We need to manage your food, your wealth, your reputation in order to complete all the different tasks and save Avalon from falling into the weirdness. Now, is there anything that I missed? I don't think so. I think you got it covered. All right. So what time is it? Well, it's time to grab our drinks. Grab our best friend and fellow adventurer. Well, we actually live in the same town in this too. And we're going to take it to the table. We're going to take it to the table. Well, we've already taken it to the table. We're going to take it back to the table and then come back at you with our review. Stay tuned for the components. Now we're going to take a look at the components for Tainted Grail, The Fall of Avalon. As usual here, we're going to start with the components that I do not have on camera. So first and foremost, we've got the rule book. Now the back of it does give you a nice quick rule summary. The rule book is very well put together. All the information that you need, list of the components, some nice art as you can see, with just like, you know, the swords from the Forlorn Swords in different locations in the game, and very straightforward, easy to use index. So overall, no complaints with the rule book. Also to teach you the game, you do get a tutorial, which is for one player, so just keep that in mind. Also, you will not be keeping anything that you gain during this tutorial. Now, the next components that I'm gonna show you have actually been modified. I've changed them just a little bit from their original state. These are the character letters. So you'll notice that each character has a number and a letter. So I, I didn't put them in order. We've got Aile and Bior. These are the two that Julie and I are playing during our campaign. We have Arev, Maggot, and Niam. And then you have four maps of the island of Avalon. So we'll just put the character letters off to the side. Let everyone take a quick look at the map. You can see where you start Quanact, and then just gives you an idea of where you need to go. So sometimes it does take you to go over to Camelot and you can actually get there fairly early on in the game. So I'm gonna put those aside. Now, if you're wondering why they're laminated, the sheets are sheets of paper, and while they're a nice quality paper and they even give a nice feel to the game, I want this game to last a long time, therefore I laminated them. They just weren't built uh, to last, at least in my opinion, but very thematic and the paper was well used. Now, let's start by taking a look at the characters. So we're gonna pick up 
all the character boards. So we've got Niam, who was an expansion character. She is designed to be played in this first scenario, the Fall of Avalon. We can take a look at the character boards. You've got their setup instructions on the back. You've got a little bit about the character and their starting resources. Now, Niam is a special. You can place her into any one of these character boards. That's why, as you can see right here, we've got all these character cards. But just to mention, her stack is a lot smaller than the others. So next we've got a Rev, Maggot, Bayor, and Islay. I do love these double layer boards to put all the different uh, trackers there. Purple's five, the red is one. You'll be using them to track all your resources and your health. We even have the health tracking marker here to tell you know what your maximum resources are. Now we'll just place that back. We'll put the characters back down and then we'll take a quick look at the miniatures. Now I'm just gonna try to make sure everything stays on camera. So here we've got the miniature for Niam. Very cool. Here we have a Rev. Lots of detail on these minis. If you want to paint them, I do think they come out quite nicely. Here we've got Maggot. We've got Aile. Now her staff didn't quite come out, I think, the way the uh, sculptors wanted it. And then we've got Bayor. So there are the four, well, five characters that you get in the base game. Now we talked briefly about the decks. So each character has their own diplomacy and combat deck. Now the ones you're gonna notice here are only named. So they all have Neom's name at the top of them. The reason for that is when you include her in the game, you're gonna be using the base decks, as you can see right here, for any one of the boards. So for example, Isla is meant to go on the green board. Well, you can just use the green base cards. You notice there's no name and that's what you would be using. Now, Isla's and Bayor's decks are actually smaller than those of the other characters, except for Neom's, because we're currently playing with them. So as you notice here, there is an ad these advancement pool cards. So these are just our two advancement pools that we've got on display. The other cards have been put into the box just to save the game. And if you're wondering how you can tell which cards are starting cards, well, these are all advancement pool cards, so there will be none in the stacks for Isla and Bayor. But when you look at Maggot's giant stack of cards here, as we're going through everything, you'll see that little banner, that's a, what tells you if it's a starting card. So if you decided to use Maggot's board for Neom, you would use these cards with the banners as well as her stack of cards right there. So as you can see, large stack of diplomacy and combat cards, we're not gonna go over them too much. You'll see with the diplomacy cards, we've got different symbols. Now for combat, you gotta be matching these symbols together. You'll find out more about those when we release our how to play video. And I think we've seen enough cards. So this is the stack that we've got for a ref. Now we've got the You Are Going Insane and the You Are Dying cards. These will come into play if your health, you know, gets down here or you're going insane. Here we've got the chapter setup cards because as you play the game, you're gonna go through different chapters. There are a total of 15 different chapters for this first game, The Fall of Avalon. Now, all the cards that you need for the chapters are right here. Sorry if I'm touching stuff and it's moving. It's quite a lot of content here. So as you can see, you've got chapter one, different parts of it. Well, I've got them all in order now. So chapter one, all the way through part six. Chapter two, so part one, part two, part three. So you can see later on, you know, chapter 10, they're all there. And then we have some special events that will show up as you play the game as well. Now, just to cover off the last little bit of tokens, we've got a Grail token and a Delayed Action token. That goes hand in hand with some of these cards. So if you play this card, you just need to play that token and remind yourself to take that Delayed Action. Now, we've got the time dials that will be inserted into the Meneers, and we'll just show you how that goes. And these will tick down as the game progresses. So since we're looking at them, Take a look at the veneers, beautiful models. I'd absolutely love to see them painted. Fortunately, I don't have 
that level of skill. So the game comes with three of them and you can only ever have three of them in play at a specific time. Now this is a four dweller model. So we've yet to run into them in our plays of the campaign, but you do have him as well. Now there are multiple dials. You're going to be using them. Uh, you can even flip them. That's why there is the grail symbol as well as the skull symbol on them. We have the dice. Now, one of these dice is for the guardians that controls their movement. The other is just a very pretty six sided die. Now mentioning the guardians, I'm going to reach over and show you something quickly. We're not going to unbox uh, those components. However, popping up right about now, you're going to see a link to our unboxing video. I'm going to try to set it up so it takes you right to the Monsters of Avalon unboxing because when you do pledge the game, you do get that edition, which is essentially models for all the different guardians. So for example, you get minis like this word bear that you can use to move around the game. Now I've taken a look at all the models. We've taken a look at all the tokens. We've seen some of the event cards. Now here are just some cards with regards to saving some stuff. So save your revealed locations, saves encounters, saving your events, just so that you can box up the game. And then we've got the random event cards, which I will show you as they do come into play. So you can have things like a full moon, good weather. So you travel costs less. You may get some heavy rainfall, meaning bad things happen. Oh, you may get run into a thread along the way. That's not good. You may get beautiful weather, which makes things even better. Howling Gale. So these random events are going to show up as you play the game. Now, all the encounters are divided up into four different encounter decks. You do get a first encounter card, which is identical for all of them. Now, when you take a look at the encounter decks, the green ones here are primary things that are going to be giving you food. You're killing creatures or things that are related to nature. When you look at the gray deck, now the gray deck is more of your human villains, as you can see. Even some other things that may end up in other decks, like these word claim guys. Oh, some of these cards are upside down. So you might run into a questing party, might run into a bow maiden. So that's what you get in the gray deck. Now your purple deck is more spiritual. So you're seeing things like demons or a disembodied veracity, a year hen rock, four magpies, an apparition, and they will often increase your terror. So be wary of them. And then lastly, we've got the blue deck with all your diplomatic encounters, which is where the diplomacy deck comes in and symbols like this as you try to gain your affinity and gain rewards. You'll notice that down here on the cards, you see what rewards you get. It's the same for the other encounters. You also do have uh, the negatives, you know. Uh, we'll take a quick look at them again so you can see just what like the monster attacks are, opportunity attack, and the loot. Don't worry. We're going to go through all of this stuff when our how to play is released. Now we've almost gone through all the components. We've taken a quick look at everything except for the locations, the items and the secrets. Now we're not going to go through the secrets, but we'll show you the items. So there's a slew of different items available in the game from weapons like an arcane staff and a javelin to a mind numbing draught. You might get a steadfast uh, parley. Palfrey, so you can get, uh, you know, faster movement. And all these things will come into play. Some can be used once, some can are used multiple times. Now, in terms of the secrets, these are items that you're going to be trying to gain, such as, and a little bit of spoil, Tainted Grail. So, obviously, you're going to need to be finding that as you go through the game. And... Taking a look at those, let's take a quick look at the reference cards. Now, for the combat overview and the double-sided diplomacy overview, there's only one. Keep it handy. You do get an order of the day card, an action overview, and then a reference card that is for each player, as well as the icon glossary. Now, the last thing we have here are the location cards, which are all numbered 101 all the way up to 199. 
So Camelot 190. Now you'll see different things on the cards. You're basically gonna be playing on a grid of nine of these cards. So you can take an action on some of them. You'll see symbols up here to tell you if it's a friendly settlement, if there's a Meneer, if you're gonna have a dream, special actions that can be taken. And if you see this lightning bolt, it is an instant action that must be taken when you enter the location. And there you have it. We've now gone through all of the components for Tainted Grail, and Julie and I are now gonna be coming back at you with a review of the game. Now before we jump on over to the review, I realized I neglected to show three components. Now I had them off to the side, and how could I forget the most important one, the exploration journal. Now, this journal has details and adventures that you're gonna be going on as you explore the world of Avalon. You can see it corresponds to different locations, and then there's different things you can do. For this section here, you're gonna use your dial to figure out where you're going. So you just place the dial in that position. It's gonna give you a number in what is known as the Book of Secrets. So you go there when you're referred to, and then in the back there is a tutorial exploration journal. I don't want to go through too much of this as there's some spoilers. Also details of dreams and things like that that you get will be listed here. So that is the exploration journal. You do have a nice save sheet for Fall of Avalon. And then on the back here, you need to track all of your different statuses. Also pay attention here because this will tell you when you have these different parts of certain statuses. Like, you know, this says go to verse 405. This says go to verse 525. Just keep that in mind. They're a little bit hard to see. Now, here we've got the Almanac of Avalon. Now, when you get, did get the all-in pledge, I'm not sure if this comes with the actual base pledge. And what you do get is a nice bit of description about areas like Camelot, the first farmhold, the Dark Morass, and it's just more lore to help suck you into the world that you're currently playing in. Then lastly, we did get this cool, nice grail notebook. I want to write in it, but I don't at the same time. I just really like it and uh, want to keep it in good condition. So now that we've got that covered, for real, this time we're coming at you with our review of the game. So Tainted Grail, The Fall of Avalon. What did you think of the game? And I think we should both give some quick thoughts and then explain to our viewers where we are actually at in the game. Because there are 15 chapters, so we're not quite at the end. But where are we? Well, you'll find out soon. <laughs> I'm not anywhere near the end. <laughs> I think what I could say to sum it up or you know, give a little scoop into what I see of it is I'd say, holy story, Batman. <laughs> There's definitely a lot of content in this. It's interesting content, but there is a lot of it. Yes, and the open world element means that gameplay time on the back is a load of crap. We went in not the wrong direction, but brief spoilers for chapter two, and these really aren't much spoilers. It's on the first card. We were told to go to three different places. We decided to go west. Now, going west, but it took us a lot longer than we needed to. However, our characters are fairly well equipped now for what's coming. So just a little hint for everyone, if you get the chat when you get to chapter two, if you'd like to advance a little quicker, go east. Go east. And that's all I really want to say about that. So suffice it to say, we are on chapter three, but how many hours have we already logged in this game? Easily ten. Yeah, we're a ten hour point in this game, which is why we were doing our review. And we both agreed we will come back and do a final campaign like re-review and an uh, overview. I don't know if we'll do it after 15 chapters because we may end up doing it in like, you don't know, a year. <laughs> well, it might take us a year to get there, but I don't think it'll take us that long. The one thing I will say is once we got things going in chapter two, when we got to a specific point, all the stories started coming at us quickly. We started getting a lot of XP. We also got a lot of hints as to where to go. And I do get the feeling this is the kind of game that if you do go off in... Maybe not the wrong direction, but you're just kind of it resting around. You're on a tangent, exactly, doing some side quests. It will take you longer, but then all of a sudden it's like boom, 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 boom. Stuff's happening, and I feel we're in a good place to tackle yeah, that I stuff. Think, I think what I would say is I felt like the first chapter we were kind of lost. 
And and I can't think I, that kind of. I disagree of, with I the first can, one. The second one, we're lost. No, I, what I mean is, I don't think we we were kind of feeling the game out, and I think that's part of you know learning the game and the mechanics as well. And we we walked, you know, we we journeyed around, uh, you know, trying things out. And I think in the as you said in the second one, we took a long time and we journeyed a lot. And I think we kind of figured out what was working a little, maybe a little bit more for us. I think we we partied together a little bit more often. Um, yeah, definitely towards the end of the second chapter, we realized, and it's something that I would recommend, especially if we're playing four players, team up, stick stick close together, and you know, kind of be like, we're gonna go here, and then maybe you branch off, and then team back up. Lets you get a lot more things done, which we didn't really realize. Well, also, we would have allowed us to share. Yeah resources a little bit more because mm-hmm. somewhere where I went and then you can't some of the things as well is, is there's the cost of opportunity you go once and you can't go back yeah and you um, got a lot of xp doing some things and I was nowhere to be found <laughs> yeah and you did one as well you did you found one as well that you were on your own that got lots of xp afterwards but so it kind of balanced out but that being said you know it ha- definitely helps when you're two uh two two players together fighting, you know, one of the different monsters or, you know, when you're doing something, I mean, it's not impossible to do alone, but at the beginning when you don't have a lot of XP, it, you know, it can get a little bit frustrating, especially when I was trying combat with my character, I'm not as combat uh, focused. Uh, So it made it a little bit harder to, you know, to come up with those challenges against different monsters or, uh, you know, other, not, they're all not all monsters. Some of them are other humans, but. Yeah, we'll talk more about the combat and the specific system and what we like and don't like about it. I think right now we want to stick sort of with just the overall game and the exploration element. So anything else you want to add to the exploration element? What did you think of going through the, the journals and uh, the, the, the journals, meneers? The journals was, uh, was fun. It was, like I said, a lot of story, but uh, it was interesting. It sometimes, you know, I, I think I might have wanted to take a little bit more notes because there are definitely some hints in there that you might want to remember. And it's one of the things I said to Jason afterwards. I'm like, one of the hints we had said going West was possible, but definitely was the harder way. And we definitely realized that afterwards. Um, For the Meneers, I think part of it, I mean. Just speaking of that, sort of jump in, but one of the reasons why we went West and it's going to fall right into what you're saying was because of lighting the Meneers and the resources. We had better resources to move West. So we ended up going West versus going East. So lighting the Meneers, you know, the fact that they expire after a certain number of, of turns and having to manage food and where you can get food and where you can get your different, different resources at the beginning, it definitely felt rough. It felt like we were, I'd say, kind of wasting our time running around trying to, you know, get food to be able to survive, but then you're getting wealth and then you're using it to light a manure that goes out because you're going to look for, for food. So that's why I said we kind of we felt our way through uh, and it was a little frustrating at first until we kind of realized that it's okay to let a manier go out and let those areas disappear. Mm-hmm. Well, once they go out, you can't, you can relight it, but you cannot light it before it goes out. Yeah. So that, that is definitely the case. And also I do think uh, we both would agree that as we started exploring more, we realized that every manier essentially has everything you will need to light the next one. So that is a very solid aspect of the design. You don't have to worry about finding the resources. They will be available around you. It's just about managing them and making sure you have the resources readily available to light the next Meneer to continue on your quest. Yeah, I I got a little, I mean, if we go to the combat next, I think we're ready to talk about that. Yeah, if you don't have anything else to add about the exploration. I'd I'd say for me, the combat was a little bit difficult to to figure out at first. It took a little getting used to how it worked. Um, And until I I was able to increase my XP a little bit, it was a frustrating experience for me because, like I said, my character is not as combat focused. Uh, I had a little bit easier time with diplomacy at the beginning. Um, Oh, you were just crushing it at diplomacy you got a bunch of xp just because of your diplomacy right but there's a lot less diplomacy tasks i find than there are combat tasks uh, yes as we've progressed on especially needing to get food and with some encounters there are definitely less diplomacy ones but they're very cool so i'm just going to talk a little bit about the system if you don't mind go ahead so with regards to how the system works essentially it is a card system you have an enemy card you then must line up 
your cards based on the different traits that your character has. Now those traits can be leveled up as you play the game, and then you need to do damage based on what you line up, or you're gonna gain reputation based on how things line up if you're doing diplomacy. Now the enemies will basically attack, which will, on diplomacy cards, knock down your chart. If it's a combat task, it will damage your character as well as also remove some of the damage that you were trying to do to them. So you gotta keep that in mind. You can play some bonus cards as you can only play one card per action. I think that's where a lot of the challenge comes in is hopefully drawing the right bonus card making the right decisions so that you avoid damage as well as continue to pro progress towards completing the task. Now you can run away, so that is an option as well. Mm -hmm. It just never seemed to work for us. Well, we did it once, once we had to, when we, uh, we bought this giant, what was it, I think a selkie, crazy monster. It's like, please draw this really nasty monster. And then I was like, we both look at our fight cards. We're like, oh, we've got all the starting fight cards. What do we need to do? Run away. <laughs> Otherwise it would have absolutely murdered us. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it, I found that, you know, the, the, I like the way the exploration works in this um, as well. And how it, every card, uh, every location that you come to has a different uh, special feature, I'd call it. Well, they don't all, but most of them do. Mm -hmm. And they have some exploration. And some of the exploration is pretty cool when you get into that story and the different things that are there. Um, and then some of them provide you resources as well. Yeah. So I thought that was that was an, an, uh, a nice aspect to this. There's also things that, depending on the order of events, that will happen that you can or can't do. For example, we found a cool item. Luckily... We made the decision, could it go to a location while we still had the item? I don't think it dawned on either of us that we could lose the item just as quickly as we got it, which let us do some cool things, get some cool items, and now we're walking around with this uh, fancy scabbard and we got a quest to go to the Tombs of Order. Yes, so don't worry, I'm remembering most of the stuff that we got to go out here. Go, sorry. The places where we need to go up here, we just need to make sure that we get this to the table on a regular basis. If we get it out at least once a week, I'm sure we'll get through this in the next little bit. Hopefully before uh, Lord of the Rings expansion comes, mm -hmm. because I know when that shows up, she can be Arwen. Mm -hmm. That's all we're going to be playing. I never know. She might be more slick than so on this. <laughs> to talk about the components, I'd say I like the player boards and the way the player boards work. and, and uh, Oh yeah, the dual layered aspects sort of jump in. I Fantastic. It's very cool. I also like, uh, you know, like the the uh, pointing system. I guess the the fact that you have those little um, cubes. I think those are very uh, those are fun. I like the colors. I like the way it works. Um, that's the kind of thing that I I like to use. I am not the biggest fan of the plastic dials in the Meneer. We have one metal one. I don't know if that's a special Kickstarter thing, but so the metal one we got when we uh, purchased uh, Nemesis. It was just sort of an add on. Now. The pledge managers are going to be reopening. I did not think I was going to be going back in to buy more stuff. I'm probably going to buy more stuff. We really enjoy the game, so we're probably looking at the playmat and the metal coins. If you've not yet picked up the game, that's one of the reasons we're actually doing the review now. But the pledge manager is supposed to open in a couple of weeks. I think the metal coins are almost an essential add-on just for visibility. Now... If you like to paint... I was going to say, if you like to paint, it'd probably make it easier to see what the... What oh, the... just there's there's paints out there called contrast paints that just actually bring out the contrast. If you are a painter and you just have a bunch of those, you could easily just like put a wash of those on there, of that on there, and you'd improve the dials greatly. But you got to flip them and things like that. I'm not so sure how the paint will hold up to that type of use. So uh, that being said, the minis are cool too. I mean, I, I like the, the minis. The minis are like the couple different ones and they're pretty... They're very detailed. Yeah. Just like everything we've gone from Awakened Realms, fantastic minis, great quality. Good card Absolute. stock. Card stock is good. Don't have to sleeve the game. We'll probably end up sleeving. You're really sleeving obsessed now. No, you did not let me finish. I said, because I would like to keep this game long term, that being said... It doesn't seem like there's necessarily enough space in this box to sleeve everything. Once we get all the expansions and everything comes in, because we did go on on the Kickstarter, I'll then look at sleeving it and preserving it long term because I can see myself going back to replay this game, not in a year, but in a year or two. It's probably a game that I don't see necessarily leaving our collection, but you never know. It's really going to depend on the thoughts once we get through 
to the end of the game. There are games I've loved and I've played the final chapter and I've been like, yeah, get this out of my face. I don't remember what one that was that just had such a disappointment. Ah, Legacy of Dragonhold. That was the one where the ending just did not match up with the overall experience. I'd like to say also from uh, the the journal perspective and the way it works, uh, you know, there's some place, some things that, you know, I like the fact that it, it avoids anybody being tempted to go try to sneak a peek at what could be happening when they're choosing what they're doing because they use uh, the dials to <laughs> yes. determine where in the book of secrets you're going to go read that next um, you know, passage. So you position the dial, the skull on the dial, and it tells you, let's say you're going to verse 264 in the, in the book of secrets. Uh, I like that. I like how that works and how there's the added little you know, mechanic yeah. to go... Uh, so I thought that was that was very interesting. I did get frustrated a few times with a couple of the different mechanics that it felt like we were kind of walking in circles, turning around in circles. I was gonna say, and I was like, okay, you, I know you want me to do this, but I can't get like, how am I supposed to get here if you won't let me get here? You know, like there's some things that it forces you, kind of forces your hand down a certain path, and then you're like, well, why did you force me down this way? I could have gone the other way. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was a little frustrating. So I think we've covered enough about sort of the, the positives. I think we should talk about some of the negatives that we have with the game. Like I said, that's what I was just doing. You are. And I'm thinking we should go more into it. But the one thing I wanted to mention positively is the artwork. You can see the fantastic art on the box. There's great art on all of the cards, combat, character art. Everything is really good at, at that level. And I do think that you get some very distinct and unique characters with an interesting backstory. There's a lot of little flavor that's added into the game to really make it feel like each character is different. And I just really want to make sure that we mention that in terms of the production quality because it's not every game that has great art. I mean, we can cite a game that I actually really like. We don't play it because the art is terrible. Legendary Encounters Firefly. Dear God, please release a second edition. Just use stills from the show. It'd be better. Anything you want to say about the art? No. I mean, it's... I, I can appreciate it. There's some of them that I find a little dark for my taste, but I can appreciate oh, it. Oh, it's the fall of Avalon, so it's yeah. supposed to be a little dark. So negatives, yes. You were mentioning spinning around in circles and getting a little frustrated with... Yeah, some of the, the dials test. that I don't love quite as much. Um, you know, it... it it also felt very long. It felt like we, it, on chapter two at least, it felt like we had no idea where we were supposed to go. Um, so, you know, but that happens. It's not a, mm -hmm. I just, I just felt at some point I was like, okay, I'm, I've been playing this game for a while and I don't feel like I'm progressing anywhere. You found a lot of cool stuff. Like we really, it was a fun experience exploring that long, but it was just frustrating not getting the information that we needed and sort of running into a dead end. Now, the one thing I will say is that by going west, when we did go east and get that piece of information, it felt like all sorts of pieces of the puzzle were coming together. We understood the areas that we were in a little better, what happened, why we found out these different things. So that was very cool. But we were definitely running into a wall and the game wasn't giving us that extra hint to be like, hey, you know what? Go east, because essentially why we started going east and we made the plan is we kind of ran into like three different dead ends and then we're like, well, these are all dead ends. We can't light this manure to keep going north. Well, guess what? We're going east. And then everything really sort of fell into place. I will say that the aspect of walking around, the game can feel a little grindy. Now, as we progressed in our skill at the game, those days when we were kind of grinding stuff out started moving very quickly. I'd say we we're going through a day in about 10 to 15 minutes at that point, or even faster. We're like, okay, we got to do this, 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 knock it out. And next thing you know, we were moving on. So that was really interesting. But that resource management aspect is tough. There was a few times we were getting close to dying or going insane. I'm surprised we didn't die. Like we got really lucky on that aspect. Got to a few locations would actually let us heal up very well but i went insane for a little bit she went insane for a little bit we just happened to find some important items that are really really useful especially the two player game because there's two of them yep so but negatives i'd say the grind the fact that you can get lost and one thing that you did mention and that story you were talking about was a secret uh well was when we went uh what's the location i think it was location 102 I'll just leave it at that. It's Hunter's area. 
And there's something you can do there. I want to spoil anything. Just make sure you have actions because we got ourselves in a tight spot because we activated the event with like no actions left, meaning we immediately lost a day. There are some actions which will start a time dial. So just keep in mind doing your explorations. If something looks like it could be, it's you a know, little bit Lord of the Ring ish, I would say that what? when you would explore, you never knew what is going to open, and you need it's it's a it's an opportunity cost, yeah. right? Like. It may be a good thing to open it because maybe it's going to help you. But if you explore something when you have no actions left, you may regret yeah, having explored. Like, just like journeys in Middle Earth. So keep that in mind. The nice thing is that when you're exploring locations, you've got lots of different choices. So if there's one that's like, ooh, that might be this, 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 and this, maybe you're better off to wait and do the easier one. Now, what's really cool about exploration is how sometimes you can spend one action and do all sorts of crazy stuff. Yes. So... I think we've talked enough about the game. This is a fairly long review, but we wanted to do something that was nice, detailed for people that are thinking about jumping in on this game. I think you can already tell where this is going, but we're going to toss it to Julie, who's going to tell you what her rating is. Oh, you want me to go first on the rating? Yeah, go first. At this point in the game, I'm going to give it a seven and a half. I think there's a chance that it'll go higher, but we played two and a half chapters. <laughs> and some of I felt, as I'll use your term, the grindiness has me dropping it by half a point. So if it hadn't been for the rush of story that we got at the end, I'd be exactly where you are. I'm giving it an 8. I think that this actually has the potential to probably go up to an 8.5 or a 9. The potential's in the box. I don't know. As Julie said, there's definitely some grinding. If things start flowing smoothly, a lot more smoothly now that we've figured out more aspects of the game and we're able to sort of limit the grind, plan our resources. I do think that it's going to get the rating to increase. However, I will say, I recommend for all players that are new to this game, take your time, learn the systems, and just plan your resources, plan your travel, and work together. And partying up is something that you really should look at doing a lot earlier than we did. I think it would have helped us out. Well, it might have slowed us down a little bit in chapter one, but in chapter two would have helped us out a lot more in the long run. We'd be actually be a lot stronger than we are. But you know what? Taking your time, if you've played a lot of role-playing games, sometimes just wandering around, leveling up, means you're a lot stronger. I mean, we probably we would have found this stuff eventually, but we're now partway through chapter three, and I'd say, what, you've got, you've gone through a couple of deck advancements to level up our characters and she's she's all loaded up with stats i think she's like missing like two things that aren't uh at level two so she's just overall a uh, badass oh and items matter yeah so, item yeah the claymore claymore's awesome get uh, one depends what you're gonna get there's lots of cool stuff <laughs> so on that note it's time to remind you to like comment subscribe hit that bell to be notified when we have new content for you so down below in the video description, you will find links to all of our social media feeds, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You want to see pictures of our quest going across the land of Avalon and Tainted Grail. They will be available there. And then popping up in front of us are going to be links to one of our most recent uploads. And then we're going to have a link to another Tainted Grail related video. For the moment, it will be the unboxing. So we did not talk about it in our review, but there are guardians, monsters that move across the map. And we did unbox the Monsters of Avalon. If you'd like to see them, they are present there. So, what time is it now? Time to grab our drinks. Grab our best friend. We're going to keep playing games. We're going to keep playing games. We're definitely going to keep playing this one. It's going to be interesting to see with all the content well, maybe coming. maybe if there's another snowstorm or something and we get kind of snowed in, we can uh, spend another couple hours playing this. Well, yeah, we're busy this weekend. We got some more reviews to do, but we'll get it back to the table soon.